This podcast was recorded on traditional Denizal land. Hello and welcome to Before the Peace. I'm your hostess with the mostest, Jenna Moreland, and I'm here with my co-host and producer of the podcast, Trey Lapashinsky. Greetings, friends. <laughs> I am back on this podcast for the first time in a minute, and um, this is actually going to be my last podcast. I'll hold back the tears for now. <laughs> I knew about it, but it's still sad nonetheless. Yeah, um, but I will be um, back intermittently. We'll mm. we'll see, um, depending on schedules and all that, but. Uh, it was a, this podcast in particular I was really looking forward to so I'm I'm happy and really grateful that I was I was able to be a part of this one. Yeah, and and like you said, uh, you know, Jenna will be here basically when she's here. Like if she wants to join in, she's welcome to come help out at any point in the podcast and we've kind of talked about her um you know just letting me know you know when she wants to come in essentially and i'll i'll keep her up to date with the guests we have moving forward so you might have a special treat uh with jenna coming back especially when after a couple months you're like oh trey so it's just trey now oh and then jenna will pop out of nowhere you'll be like oh okay finally now i can listen to it no please keep listening with me doing it too (laughs) yeah and and this like honestly this has to be one of the best experiences i've ever Mm. had in my life doing this podcast i'm so grateful for all the experiences that i got to be a part of and i'm just so excited that you get to keep doing this so yeah it's been very impactful for both jenna and i and i've said this before uh, you know, Jenna's one of my best friends here in, in Fort St. John, and we grew pretty close pretty fast. And I think the, one of the main reasons to that is not only her bugging me to come over and hang out, <laughs> but it's also the podcast. Mm-hmm. And, um, you know, she was a, a big part of, of kickstarting it, and I just kind of jumped on board and, and helped out in any way I could. And now it's become our baby. So it's sad to, to see Jenna leave, but We'll, we'll be good. I, I swear I will take care of this baby that is ours. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you will. <laughs> uh, now, moving into the, today's episode, uh, we had Marshall Pitts and Brittany Puddock both speaking on the connection between their identities, such as their indigenous heritage, their gender, their sexuality, and their respective journeys. We also get an insight into terms regarding the LGBTQ+. Uh, we talk about the resources in Fort St. John, and uh, we also talk about how the city has kind of moved to being a little bit more diverse and an inclusive city. Obviously, there is still more progress to be made. Uh, we talk about kind of the comparison to to major centers like Edmonton and Vancouver. Uh, will we ever get to those levels? Probably not based off population, but it seems with the resources we have and the people that we have in the city, we're kind of moving in that direction. So we have a great talk there. Honestly, this episode was... I mean, I've loved every single episode, and Same. of course we're going to say that, we're biased, uh, but this episode for me was a big learning experience. It's um, a very special one. Yeah, it's, it's a very special one, and and you know, we get into a lot of, of, of sexual identity too, which I think is, is so interesting, and it's something that all of us should know. Mm-hmm. Uh, and it's this is a very inclusive episode for sure, and this is something we've aimed for. And we wanted Marshall and Brittany on for the past couple months after we met Marshall at Healing the Hoop last year, mm-hmm. and it was it was just a great conversation. We learned a lot. Um, like I said, it's a very educational uh, episode. Uh, one thing I did want to mention: there were audio issues for the first 10, 20 minutes of the episode. But in the midst of Jenna interviewing Brittany and Marshall, I was running around trying to fix the audio. So after that mark, for the, it's about an hour and a half interview. Uh, the rest of the audio is good after the 10, 20 minute mark. You can still understand what Marshall is saying because that's whose mic was messed up. It just, it sounds like he's speaking in a cave. Yeah, it's a little like kind of echoey. Yeah, it's a little echoey, but I did end up fixing it during the podcast. Still worth the listen Mm -hmm. because like, I feel like everything that's said in this episode is so important. Yes, 100%. But if you, it does bother you because there are some people out there where like little audio, audio issues like that, they won't be able to kind of focus on the speaker. If that's the case. 
I recommend you just skip to minute 20 and uh, listen from there. Um, Marshall does say some really great th- things in the beginning. Yeah, so yeah. so I mean, even if you go back, I, I don't highly recommend that you skip it. But if it is bothering you, the rest of the, the episode is really important. And I, I do recommend that you, you listen to the full episode for sure, for sure. Yes, and our social media, um, I would like you guys to please follow Before the Peace on Instagram and Twitter. I'm going to continue doing the social media uh, for Before the Peace, so it's going to be active still. So please follow us um, at Before the Peace on Instagram and at Before the Peace underscore on Twitter. And I, this is something I've never mentioned, but another way to reach out to us, if you have story ideas or comments, you can reach out to us on Instagram or Twitter too. Yeah, yeah. But as we've been saying, another easy way to do so is before the piece at energeticcity.ca. Again, if you have any comments, story ideas, and then, like I said, social media, uh, we're pretty active there. Uh, we're trying to be more active. Um, it's good that Jenna's taking care of social media because <laughs> I am not good at it and I do not have time for it. It's kind of in her realm for her job anyway. So it kind of works out. <laughs> and of course, this podcast wouldn't be possible without the help of Troyer Ventures. Troyer has been serving our community and the energy industry with tank and back trucks since 2000. They're built on the principles of hard work, service, and community. And they're proud to offer the financial support to make this program possible. Also, shout out to Epscan Industries who are known for building excellence safely. All right, let's get into it. Here's Brittany and Marshall. So this is the first time that we've had more than one guest on Before the Peace. So why don't you guys just introduce yourselves so people can get to know your voices a little bit. Uh, my name is Brittany Puddock. That's my English name. My indigenous name is Wabi Maniganque. Um, I was born and raised here in Fort St. John. Uh, my traditional territory is over in Manitoba. Um, my family went through the 60 scoop and residential school. Um, so I was born and raised over here with my non-Indigenous family. So um, my life, especially my adult life, has been a process of reconnecting with my um, Indigenous family and my Indigenous culture. Um, but I am Anishinaabe. Okay, very cool. And is that okay? I wait. I'm I, I'm not going to go into questions yet. I have so many. <laughs> Hold on. Okay, now Marshall, you go ahead. Yeah, who wouldn't want to follow that? Yeah. <laughs> My name is Marshall Pitts. Um, I was not born and raised in Fort St. John, but I am a uh, long-term transplant. I've been here since uh, permanently since 2009. I'm originally from Northern Ontario, and uh, my family's territory is in Ontario as well. Uh, I'm Anishinaabe as well. Um, And again, I I actually don't know a lot about my my history, my culture, my my indigeneity, and I'm actually just starting that process of reconnecting and and rediscovering uh, my culture and and what that means to me. So um, I I think I'm where Brittany was five, ten years ago. Uh, So it's, it's been a an interesting beginning of the process so far and and there's a lot of tough things to uncover and just looking forward to learning what all that means to myself and my my family and my history so we actually met me and you marshall at healing the hoop last year in 2022 um, that was our first introduction of each other and th- healing the hoop was so amazing in many different ways, but it is a really great way to explore your indigenous heritage and really it just opens up so much. So if anybody out there is listening and has the opportunity to go to healing the hoop, I, it's, it's great. It's happening soon in Prince George, but by the time this episode comes out, it's probably already out. <laughs> But I, I was just wondering, so you are very close with David Daniels, right? Yeah, he's my elder. He's the one who named me. Oh, wow. So he's wow. my, my guime. That's what we call each other. Um, he's my name giver. And so there is a level of responsibility that we have to each other. Um, because when somebody names you, um, he gave up his life force in order to do that. And so um, I'm responsible to him and he's responsible to me. Wow. And it's a uh, yeah it's a big responsibility wow that's very cool i've never heard of that before yeah. 
Uh, and so being in Manitoba, that's that's where he is from as well, right? Yeah, and yeah. he actually lived on uh, my family's res for okay. a long period of time. And, and this is... Uh, the way that I've been taught is called synchronicity. I think a lot of people call it coincidences, but uh, for us, it's more of like um, the creator bringing us together. So the artwork that's on his business card was actually drawn by my cousin. Wow. Yeah. <laughs> that's crazy. So for those of you listening, we interviewed David Daniels last um, year when he was here for Healing the Hoop in 2022. And we didn't get much time with him. Honestly, I, I feel like we could interview him for an entire day and it wouldn't be enough time. Like he has so much knowledge and he's so interesting to listen to. So I, I find it so fascinating that you grew up with him and like you were I didn't part, grow up with him. Like, so wait, so he <laughs> named you and then and then you were apart for... I, did so you I see only got him? my name. I met him at a conference here in town, not Healing okay, the Hoop. Okay. But this would have been probably... Oh gosh. So he named your so he gave you your indigenous name as an adult. As an adult. Yeah. Okay. I okay. So I've I've kind of heard of um is it kind of like a, adopting in a yeah, way? Yeah, so he um has adopted me. He calls me his daughter. Okay. Um and I view him like a father. Oh. And um it's really amazing to have because all my indigenous family is in Manitoba and I'm just really starting to get to know them. And so to have somebody that is has taken me on and is teaching me things um is a gift that i i don't even know how to to process it into words i can only imagine i mean just spending any time with him is is so precious Mm -hmm. so marshall what are some of the things that you really took away from healing the hoop last year uh well actually this whole room worth of relationships um, <laughs> yeah so Brittany and i actually didn't meet until healing the hoop last year as well okay and i think i would actually count her as one of my closest friends now um, mm-hmm. definitely one of my closest Aww. confidants and just that that level of support knowing that i'm not the only one out there who knows virtually nothing about where they come from other than bits and pieces that mom might have told you sort of thing mm-hmm. um and that it's it's okay to not know it doesn't make you any less indigenous yeah um that's a a big takeaway for me and i'm really looking forward to healing the hoop this week because it's the first one that they're running where there's going to be a lot of discussion about being lgbtq plus and what that affects your how that affects your indigeneity and Mm -hmm. how your indigeneity affects that and how as Brittany said, there are no coincidences. It's all in the synchronicity. Synchronicity? Synchronicity. I call it sim. It's <laughs> very sim. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> um, but it, it, it's amazing how that all flows together. And even if you're not in touch with that cultural root of yourself, it does impact you. So I'm, I'm looking really forward to this uh, this week and learning more um, and actually helping lead some of the the healing circles and the the men's fire circle that goes along with healing a hoop and and just more and more learning about where it is that I come from. Well, it just it just goes to show like connection can mean so much. I mean, like if you met David at a conference and, you know, we met at Healing the Hoop, like so much can happen from these connections and I just think it's really cool mm-hmm. and just being open to it and letting it happen. Very cool. So I would like to get into a little bit about um, your guys, like gender wise, as well as culturally, like how do you identify? Um, So I identify as two spirit. Um, That can mean different things to different indigenous people. Um, It's kind of similar to the word queer, um, except that it is a indigenous only kind of identity um it's a word that came into use in the 1990s um it's obviously an english word um but it encompasses both um your aspects of gender and or sexuality and your indigeneity um because for a lot of people those can't be separated and so it is an important identity to use for myself um, because 
my identities are so intertwined that it can be difficult for me to just um, pick and choose and try to explain them in Western ways. Um, like any identity, there's a lot of discourse around it. Mm -hmm. And so depending on who you ask, you're gonna get a different definition from one person to another. There are gonna be some people who say that you can't use that um, you know, term two-spirit unless you are um, gender non-conforming or trans. There's gonna be other people who can say, no, you can use that if, as long as you're not straight. Um, and other people who don't really care. So, I, so it, you said that two spirited didn't become a thing until like the nineties, but but this was this term in like indigenous cultures was used so for many many years, right? Two spirit as the term is the term itself is modern. The concept itself is ancient. Okay, so each culture has its own gender system um and that is like i said different to each culture so um i don't want to speak on cultures that aren't my own um but some may have as many as five or seven genders okay. um, and different gender roles and along with those gender roles come specific cultural roles and expectations and um because of things like residential school um, and colonization, a lot of those roles have been, I don't want to say lost, um, but have been stigmatized. Um, and so there are people nowadays who say that, you know, we, we've never had trans people, we've never had gay people, we've never had, you know, this and that, and it, it just simply isn't true. Mm -hmm. um, because trans people, gay people, um, queer people in general have always been here. And so for me, that is part of the reason why it is so important that I do identify as two-spirit. However, there are other people who are going to say that you shouldn't use the term two-spirit unless you have your community-specific cultural role that comes along with your gender identity. So that could mean like, like what does that mean? Like, like knowledge keepers? Yeah, and, so, okay. so yeah, in a lot of communities, um, their specific two-spirit roles may include things like taking care of the children or um, specific ceremony roles. Um, and for someone like me, who is just starting to reconnect, I don't have that knowledge yet. Mm -hmm. um, and there are other people who may not be interested in carrying that role specific in their community. Um, and I think that for me, it's very important that even though I do not have that cultural role in my community, my traditional community, mm -hmm. um, that I still am able to identify as two-spirit. So I personally am one of those people who are like, oh, you're native, you're queer, um, whether you're trans or not, um, then you can identify as two-spirit. So that's why it's important to me. It's a very complex yeah. identity. Yeah. Um, and you're going to get different answers from one person to another. But like, I just, I wish like people could just identify with whatever they wanted and not have all these rules attached to it. Like you can only identify as this if you're this or whatever. They, I, don't, I don't know. Is yeah. that naive to say? Um, no, I don't think it's naive. I think that when it comes to matters of identity, people hold it so close to their heart that there seems to be a lot of policing that comes along with it. Um, and I think the other part of it is when it comes to indigenous things in general, um, there is an aspect of people call it gatekeeping. Outsiders call it gatekeeping. Um, but for us, it's um, not necessarily a matter of gatekeeping. It's um, it, it goes in line with reciprocity and our responsibility to each other. So um, when somebody asks you, when somebody is indigenous and they ask you like, who are you related to? Um, where do you come from? Um, 
it's not that they're trying to figure out whether you're, you know, a pretending or you're fake or whatever. It's that they're trying to know who they know that is related to you. Because once they have that established, um, then they know their responsibilities to you and then they take care of you. Mm. And so just like at the beginning of this, when we realized how we were all connected, Mm -hmm. right? Or how David Daniels is connected to to me through, you know, my community. Yeah. And that is part of the reason I think why instantly he started, you know, like working with me so closely and, and adopting me. And so that... I think for a lot of people does come across as gatekeeping, um, but it is also an important cultural aspect as well. So is adopting, is that quite um, common in the Indigenous communities? Because I've noticed like George with with Christy and like I've, I've I've heard it multiple times now of um, there's being these adoptions in adult life. Is that quite common? Do you guys know? Um. I, I, I think it is a lot more common in an indigenous community and an indigenous culture than it is in Western culture, simply because in my experience, um, I've, I've seen it be more common simply due to the fact that it's a very community-based approach when it comes to the responsibility of, of bringing up children. And, you know, as, as Brittany alluded, it's the, how are we connected? Because I want to know my responsibility to you Mm -hmm. and so i think well i mean like as like a single mom they use the word tribe all the time like who's your tribe and i guess that kind of has the Um, absolutely and i I think yeah it it's definitely more common because there's this sense of responsibility and i think it all often comes down to also a shared uh a shared experience and knowing that you know the reason that Brittany doesn't have connection to her family or that I don't have connection to my family and my heritage and, and you know, that, that that connection was lost. We all share in that loss. And so it's almost as if these elders want to share a great connection as mm-hmm. well, you know, and it's, it's passing on that healing that they've done because hurt people hurt people, but healed people help heal people. Yeah. So I think it, it comes down to a sense of responsibility and, and just a sense of community. And so, yeah, it probably is a lot more common within indigenous communities than it would be in, in western culture okay and so do you identify as two-spirited no i identify as a pansexual man um and it's very interesting even just hearing about Brittany's experiences and and her identity as as two-spirit um it's for me my culture and my my identity have been somewhat separate simply because of the fact that I don't know what I don't know. And my being pansexual and a man is is very innate. It's always been very core to my central being. However, I don't know if that's part of my cultural background or if that's just simply due to my spirit and my soul could be a combination of both and I think it absolutely is it's just I don't know how to consider that at this moment so uh, no I identify as a a pansexual man and um, for me that's always come down to honestly the role that I want to play in people's lives you know when people ask well how do you how do you know how do you know I said well when I think about who I want to be when I'm when I'm in a relationship I want to do those those things and fill those roles as a, a loving, protective husband would protect his his partner. I want to have those experiences as uh, as a father to my son, and and how I'm with my partner. I want to have those experiences as a man would with with his partner. Not you know, and again, well, what what does that look like? What what are things that are inherently men versus women? It's hard to say, but mm-hmm. I've just always known that when I am with a partner, I want to be their boyfriend. I want to be their husband. I, I want to be somebody's father. I want to be somebody's brother. And those roles that, that somebody with that term or name or pronoun would fill, to me, in my life, that's what I want to be for those people. So I've always just, it's been very inherent and... It's, it's really interesting. So now I'm wondering how much of my just 
my my ancestral DNA is steering the ship when I don't it's even realize rooted. it. Yeah, yeah. So for our listeners, what what does pansexual mean? Yeah, uh, so pansexual, it, it's kind of funny because I actually originally in high school came out as bisexual, um, thinking, well, I, I'm not exclusively attracted to men, I'm not ex- exclusively attracted to women. And that was good enough. At least then I could date who it was that was in front of me that I had a connection with. Um, but as more and more time passed and there were more gender expressions more information. and more information yeah. came forward. So bi obviously has the, 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 the procedure of being two. And it, it can be kind of um, exclusionary for a lot of people because if you think, well, there's only, there's, and you hear it a lot, there's only two genders. Well, no, there's not. There's many. Well, there's only two sexes. Okay, well, what about intersex people? And right off the hop, you disprove this binary of there's one or the other. And so for me, that's where bisexuality didn't quite fit. Mm-hmm. And so when you move into other um, other terms, when you look at the, the root of it, you know, pan, it means, you know, like there's there's the, the pan-African continent, there's the pan-Asian continent, and that just means it's traversing multiple so it's more than two but not all encompassing and that for me is where i feel comfortable at this moment um identifying is that i am attracted to multiple gender expressions and sexes and combinations thereof and that's how i identify it i I identify it there are some people who say well you're either straight bi or pan there are some people who say well no there's actually one thing above pan which is omni which would mean all and that's where we get into a lot of yeah like how does that differ differ from pan then uh so bi would be two yeah pan would be more than two but not all combinations thereof and omni would be literally any combination of sex and er, gender identity um so whether it be a, a trans man who has not had surgery a trans woman who's not had surgery uh, non-binary, gender fluid, um, cisgender men or men and women, whatever the case may be, um, they don't feel that there's a limit on who they could be sexually and rom- romantically attracted to. Whereas, you know, a pan person might feel that there are limits. And then there are some people who, you know, like when I came out as bi, I was like, oh, that's good enough. I can be who, who I, with who I want to be with. And then the term pan came about and I went oh okay you know that that is actually more representation of what I I feel and so Omni is just I think in the last five years really become a a a circulated term and I'm not quite sure if I'm ready for yet another identity (laughs) shift so I think at this point I'm I'm comfortable with Pan yeah and as I do more soul searching I think at the end of the day for me it's just I'm Marshall and I'm a yeah. human and I am interested in the human experience. Um, I don't like the idea of putting a limit on who it is I could be with because there are 8 billion people on this world and I think it's naive to think that there's to, to think that you've met every combination of human being so I just like to remain open to the idea of, of human connection. So being indigenous and then queer on top of that I mean, they're two very, like, it's very, yeah, marginalized, very. And so combining those two, it it can probably be um, confusing, but then also, I don't know what the right word is. I'm trying to... Do you know what I'm trying to say? Yeah, because I was going to have a similar question. So, Oh, here we are sharing a mic again. <laughs> so basically what I was going to ask is, um, and I think this is where Jenna was going, I just kind of wanted to start with myself. Like, I didn't really start to look at my cultural identity being Métis until the last year. After Healing the Hoop is when I took it very seriously. And for me, that's been hard, mm-hmm. really doing that soul searching. Mm-hmm. With you guys having you know you know being uh in two separate marginalized groups and those identities and searching for how stressful is that like what kind of weight does that hold 
in your mind because I, I can't imagine coming from from my side of things which just seems so small in comparison I don't that's hard to answer because I don't think it's something that we just like walk around on day to day like thinking about how um how queer am I yeah how indigenous am I yeah how do these things intersect in my life but and make might, things harder <laughs> It must come up. Oh, definitely. In situations yeah. quite frequently. Yeah, I yeah. mean, there's definitely situations where, um, in indigenous spaces, where, especially because of colonization, where homophobia and transphobia exists and comes out, and you don't necessarily feel comfortable, especially as somebody who's reconnecting, who already maybe doesn't feel mm -hmm. comfortable, that that's a whole nother thing. Um, and then in queer spaces where it can predominantly be um, non-native people um, and, you know, something comes up or, you know, there's a, a certain topic or issue and it all of a sudden really hits you, like how much you really even though these are supposed to be your people, your community, you really are different. Mm -hmm. And so that feeling of being different can can come up. Um, but yeah, that topic of, of intersectionality um, is very layered and it can come up again and again in different scenarios and with people that you feel should be your people, right? And it just depends on the topic at hand. I found in my personal experience. And do you feel more acceptance um, with more the indigenous people than you do with um, just everybody else? Is there more of an understanding, I guess, is my question? Because I'm just so curious because two-spirited obviously goes back very far. And, it, and to me, it almost seems like there was more acceptance and this was more... Um, talked about I guess you could say for many many years prior to it becoming you know in the 90s what it was so I, I'm or is it there's still the kind of black cloud a little bit like I said I think colonization plays a, a huge role yeah in people's attitudes I would love to say that in every native space that I'm in um that I don't see homophobia and transphobia um, but I do, and I f and um, it can feel unsafe. And um, there are people who, um, you know, make you feel safe, and and you know that are very accepting of two spirit people, and you know that you are are accepted for being indigenous and for being queer to mm -hmm. spirit um but that's not always the case and it is the same as when i'm in queer spaces right i will go there and i know that i'm accepted for being queer trans to spirit whatever my identity is but i may not necessarily feel accepted or, sa or safe being indigenous in that space yeah that makes sense so, and so you grew up in fort st john right yeah so how do you think it is compared <laughs> now to what it was do you think we've come a long way um with acceptance um i i do think that we have definitely come a long way um it does feel like we've made a little bit of a backslide in recent years um i don't know if it's because people feel like they can be more vocal in their hatred um especially on social media yeah yeah um i mean i used to sit on pride um i used to work the trade show i used to do all sorts of things where i was working with the public and i never had a outwardly negative experience um i don't feel that it would necessarily be the same today. Um, I am still involved in um, different activities throughout the city and 
I am still actively working to make this a safe and inclusive city for everyone. Um, and I don't think that we need to stop that um, because I think that people need to relearn what, um, I guess they need to relearn how to interact properly with people that they don't necessarily agree with. Mm -hmm. Because even if they don't understand or accept or whatever it is, you can still be respectful. Just be willing to listen yeah. is what I've always said. You don't have to agree, just listen. Yeah, yeah. I, I, I think there's a level of civility that's, that's missing in everyday society where that's okay. You, you're not trans, you're not gay, you're not bi, you're not queer. That's okay. You don't have to be. And you don't even necessarily need to 100% understand it or be 100% comfortable with it because people aren't comfortable with things they don't understand. Nobody yeah. has ever enjoyed not understanding something. But there is still a level of civility that every human being is owed. I don't agree with a lot of things a lot of people do, but I'm still expected to have a, a certain level of civility. Yeah, so I agree. It's it's again it's it's having to relearn as as Brittany said you know learning how to interact with people in a in a respectful manner and you know saying i don't agree with that okay you know you you're you're saying you don't agree with somebody's core existence and fundamental identity well that sucks but okay you don't agree with it let's unpack that mm -hmm. why don't you agree with it and as long as they're able to have a civil discussion and maybe be open to learning something, I can work with that. But it's the idea that... My way or the highway. Exactly. Yeah. No, I don't need to learn anything because I know everything. Um, and it's... Or that's how they were taught growing up. So that's the end all be all what they were taught. Mm -hmm. right? Exactly. Yeah. And I think a lot of that comes with diversity. Like you can probably speak on this, Trey, like Fort St. John has become much more diverse over the years yes. than it used to be. I mean, when I first moved here, it was pretty much all white. Yeah. <laughs> and so it's, it, but it's nice having that diversity. Like, cause didn't you write an article on this? Well, we did an investigative article basically on racism in the city. And um, just as you guys were talking, the, the biggest thing, and I've done my own separate research um, specifically with Black Lives Matter, and it's just an issue that's really close to home for me. I was born and raised in Edmonton, um, Clairview, a very multicultural community. Mm -hmm. um, so when I first moved out of Edmonton for my career in Lloyd Minster, and then here, mm -hmm. it was a shock for me, yeah. right? Oh, yes. And so we were doing this story, and one of the biggest things that I learned is there's the micro racism and there's yeah. the macro racism and i think the same thing goes goes with homophobia transphobia things like that where the microaggressions are like things that almost just come out of them that might they might not even think about it right they might just make some comments that are very much racist or homophobic or transphobic but they don't think about it you think of like tv shows yeah like yep. i bet you you can find some homophobic or transphobic remarks in uh friends big bang theory things like that just based off the time right absolutely but what i've seen is i think it seems like there has been a backslide in fort st john as Brittany was mentioning but what i like to see is is these little small things such as taffy pride making more of uh, an impact in the community and coming out more um, that wasn't supposed to be a joke, but there it is. But I'll <laughs> love it. You know, and and so I, I I think we're far behind the major centers, but being born and raised here, do you think this p little progress that's being made is good enough, and that it will you know expand in the near future? Like hopefully we go through in the next couple of years, you know, a big boost maybe with more people coming to the city with that kind of mindset of like being open to everyone. Like what are your guys' thoughts on that within the diversity and things? I know that's a big question to unpack, but what is the first thing that came to your head as I'm talking about this? Yeah, uh, it's funny you mentioned those those micro aggressions or, or, or micro comments. And, you know, somebody asked me actually on Saturday, well, what is your opinion on the, 
the the multiple personalities and I, we were talking about you know the lgbtq community i said um i'm sorry multiple personalities we we were talking about the queer community how did we get onto the the psychoanalysis of of you know uh like being diagnosed with like and, DID, and, what? <laughs> and so you know, he said, "Well, you know, the 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 we's and the they's and the that." And I'm like, "Oh, they them." Oh, he's like, yeah, yeah. Oh, I was like, "Okay, so why did you say multiple identities?" And he's like, "And you know, he's he's a 60 year old man. He's got a very kind heart, but again, it's not something that he would have ever had to think of that that might not be an appropriate way to phrase that." And so I, I kind of, you know, I chuckled it off and I said, okay, well, why did you phrase it? Like, he said, well, isn't they, them? Like, that's, that's a, that's multiple. And I said, well, somebody left their wallet here. I hope they come back to get it. And he just looks at me and he just got this like wide-eyed look. He said, you're right. <laughs> <laughs> I said, so next time when you think about gender neutral pronouns, you, you don't think about how many times you use a they, them in a, a, a singular form. And it, it's almost as soon as this this topic of well my my pronouns are they them and people suddenly well those are those are multiple they forget about all the thousands of times they've used they or them in a a neutral singular phrase and so it's just one of those things that he didn't even think about and luckily he again he has a very kind heart and so he 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 was very accepting of the fact that he's like. You're right. I was wrong. Okay, moving on. And, uh, you know, and he just he worked it into his head, and we were talking about those things of you know what you can do to be more inclusive, just in the, in the way you you speak. And so he said, well, what about you know when you're talking to a group of of people and you say the ladies program, you know, you're talking to a men's club and you say the ladies program. I said, you know that that's obviously an assumption. You're assuming every man in that room is heterosexual and has a wife or a, a female partner or a partner that may even be female but doesn't necessarily go by lady. She, they may be gender neutral. And he said, so what should we say? He said, the partner's program, you know, or the plus ones. What are you doing for the plus ones? I said, there are, you know, the sweeties, the honeys. You can, you can say almost anything besides the wives. And I think... Yes, uh, since 2009, you know, I've been coming out to Fort St. John since 2006. It has definitely become much more inclusive. Um, you know, the first Pride Walk that happened, my wife and I were there, and it was it was nerve wracking. She said, "You know, are we safe?" I said, "I don't know, but we're gonna go anyway." And we went, and year after year, it becomes a little less of a worry, but it's, unfortunately, it's still in the back of a lot of people's heads, and that's not necessarily a great thing. It's not a great thing, but it's, it's, it's not necessarily an uncommon thing. I'm sure if you spoke to a lot of people who were there, they'd be thinking the same thing, or as soon as you point it out to them, they, they wonder, yeah, you know, were we safe? We, we were safe, but was that a guarantee? And... You know, it has come a, a long way, but I think it's we've got a long way to go. Um, but progress is progress. Do I think we'll ever get to the point of Vancouver? Uh, I, I'm not sure. And, and, and it's also not a safe assumption to say that homophobia and transphobia don't exist in larger cities like that. Yeah. So there's just more diversity mm -hmm. and, and, more, yeah. and more education. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. I think that... We have definitely come a long ways back when I graduated, which was a while ago now. Um, pretty much anybody who was out moved away. Um, there, I mean, yes, there was a queer community here, but um, they were not as out and proud and visible as they are now. Yeah, it used to be pretty underground. Yeah, up here. yeah. and <laughs> um, now to have different events that we have around town where we get together and socialize in public places safely, um, that's huge, and that's different, you know? Like, Pride has a coffee event every month. Taffy, uh, I'm on the board of Taffy, we have a coffee event every month. Pride has a youth group at the library. Taffy has a youth group that meets every month and like to have these different events where people can get together and people can just be themselves in general that's a big shift mm -hmm. 
I think it's also cool to see when these organizations in town, these local businesses are also tacking their name onto Taffy or Pride events as well. I think that's a huge step too as a community, right? Yeah, and we have seen a major uptick in the amount of businesses that are willing to put their names out there and also to put money behind that so that we can host events. Um, and that's just so amazing for our community as a whole, not just for queer people who are able to experience events, but allies that can come out and experience events, but also for, I think, public at large to be able to see like, hey, like this is going on and people are supportive. I just wonder what things are going to be like, you know, 20 years from now. Like, I'm just so curious. Like, so what are some of the resources available out there? Are there a lot or are there not much? Specifically here in town? Yeah. Um, so Pride is here in town and they do have some resources. Uh, I think they have a list of resources. Um, Taffy is here in town, um, relatively new, um, do have some resources, but are hoping to offer things specifically like gender affirming gear, um, and, you know, different things that will help trans people feel more comfortable to be themselves. Um, I know that there are different organizations around town that offer um, not just gender affirming care, but um, safe spaces for queer people. Taffy has a phone line, don't they? They or do. Or just like a message line? Um, yeah, so we are currently in the process of getting a new phone number, um, but we have a Facebook and an Instagram right now, um, but we do offer services such as going into the hospital to sit with um, people who are suicidal um, because the suicide rate is so high for um, queer people, especially for trans people. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, offering different services that are on the ground um, in order to keep our community safe i just think taffy is such a, a beautiful thing because you know i know someone who's very close to it as well and was kind of there once it sparked as an idea and turned into the group and now you're offering you know services like these that is you're talking about 20 years jenna yeah. with people doing residents doing things like this and starting organizations and having resources like this i think you know, I don't think it's going to be monumental, but I think we're going to keep moving towards being more, you know, not only diverse, but socially acceptable across with everyone, right? More open for sure. Yeah, it makes me hopeful for my kids and, you know, their kids and mm -hmm. yeah, yeah. I, I want to touch base on something. Um, you know, there's a lot of conversation about, well, there's North Peace Pride and then there's Taffy. You know, which one should I be going to? Why, why do we need both? And I think it goes back to, uh, you know, as we were talking about being marginalized within a marginalized group. Um, so literally anyone who identifies as some form of what I like to call the rainbow mafia <laughs> is, is welcome at North Peace Pride. However, Taffy does offer kind of those more direct to a, 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 one of the specific groups within Pride. Uh, those resources are more directed towards specific issues that they would have. So as Brittany mentioned, gender affirming care. If you are a cisgender uh, gay man, you don't really need um, access to resources in, term of, in terms of uh, gender affirming gear or um, help acquiring gender affirming care. So this is more of a, a streamlined, focused group that can offer those um, you know, little added touches and especially um, within a group of people who, who get it. Um, you know, it, it, it could be very difficult for a uh, cisgender gay man to understand what a uh, transgender man is going through, but another trans person can commiserate and, and empathize, and not only empathize, but sympathize with that as well. So um, pride is open to all, and Taffy is more specific to the gender-related uh, resources and, and issues that people might be facing. So either or both. <laughs> either or both. Yeah, and, and the thing is about both is that, um, you know, the bigger our community, the more accepting we are, um, the bigger presence we have. And, um, you know, we have kids that 
and and adults that access both groups um, whether they're trans or not and I think it's really amazing to see people that are coming out that aren't trans um, or that may be questioning um, or you know are just really supportive and I love it it's beautiful so can you just um, give the lowdown on cisgender and all that stuff so we can like make sure our listeners are fully yeah yeah, yeah. it's um there there there's a lot of terms and it's it's easy to get lost in the minutia of them and then decide that you don't want to learn them because it's just too hard mm. uh, so the term cis first like as opposed to trans um you know it is the it's it's sort of like pre versus post it's they are just uh what is the word i'm looking for the when you tack it on to the beginning of a word it's prefix prefix yes so the different prefixes thank you Brittany. so you sure always knows what my brain's doing <laughs> i taught um, in english so it's fine it's it's the different prefixes that would uh identify something about your gender so cis is the latin prefix for essentially remaining um, it is remaining true, not true, but remaining and, and, and co-aligned and, and in line with what you were assigned at birth and what society says you sh- most likely should identify as based off of that. So Trey, you know, you and I've had this conversation before you were assigned male at birth and you identify as a man. So therefore you're, uh, I always say junk and gender because it's yeah. so much easier for people <laughs> yeah. to understand yeah. that there's your junk and your gender. I love um, that. <laughs> <laughs> but yours are in line with what society would say that you as a man should have. However, a, a trans woman, for example, um, may have been born male at birth, but identifies at her gender as a woman. So trans meaning having um, traversed or changed or have varied from the associated norm, quote unquote. Um, so it's it's essentially stating that you do not identify as trans it's kind of um it, it's it's one of those terms that you know it's people go oh i'm straight well that's hetero, your sexuality yes. yeah <laughs> that, that that you can be straight all you want but your gender is very different um so it's yeah there's there's your junk your, 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 there's your gender and then your, there's your sexuality and then not only is there your gender, but there's also your gender expression, which is an entirely different uh, can of worms that we could probably spend all afternoon talking about. Um, but yeah, the, the essentially I always tell people, do you understand the difference between heterosexual and homosexual? And they said, yeah, one's straight, one's gay. I said, yep, that's essentially, you're right. Cisgender as opposed to transgender is, one is their gender is congruent with what society says they should be as opposed to or in, in relation to what they were assigned at birth in terms of their sex and transgender is that their gender differs from what society says they should be um, based off of their sex that they were assigned at birth. So. Gotcha. When I first learned the term cisgender, um, you know, obviously I knew that trans people existed. Um, I did not realize that I fell under the trans umbrella at that time. Um, But when I first learned it, I was like, why do cis people need a label? Like, that's that's just normal. Um, Not you're such a gatekeeper. (laughs) Not realizing because we were talking about microaggressions and how inadvertent they can be. And that's the thing is that I always viewed myself as a trans ally and um, would never knowingly hurt my trans friends um but the intent doesn't have to be there for it to be harmful or for it to be damaging Mm -hmm. and i think it's really important that we can take a look at our biases and how even if they're non-intentional we can still hurt people so should i should i be using that i'm so would i say i'm a cis female then you just say cis woman cis woman yeah cis woman now hang on do you identify as a woman yes okay so yes you would be a cis gender or cis cisgender woman or a bisexual cis woman woman. yeah Yeah. okay interesting Mm -hmm. so i like i guess i'm just wondering by me using the word cis that 
would imply more of uh, being an ally. In yeah. A way. Yeah. And that's the same. Trans people. Yeah. Yes. It's the same thing as when people use their pronouns, even if they're cis, right? By adding she, her, yep. for example, to your email signature, yep. um, that just makes it more normal uh-huh. for everyone to do it, right? So there are small things that people can do yep. to be Absolutely. more of an ally. Yes. Okay. I like that. Yeah. Um, but going back to what Marshall said a while ago about, you know, his. Um, journey from bisexual to possibly omnisexual. Um, right now it's pan. I, yeah, I, yeah. I think any more shifts right now? I have no more, no more room for shifts. But. It's interesting because um, I first came out as bi, and that is currently, I guess, what I identify as. I usually use just queer because um, to me that means not straight. Um, but for me, because I I'm gender non-conforming, non-binary, whatever term, I guess, fits for today. Um, Bi still works for me because for me, it's not two genders. It's my gender and other genders. Uh Mm. So, yeah, it's still two, but it's not man, woman. I see. Yeah. Gosh, it's so interesting. (laughs) I I, I think ultimately it's, it's important to note that, you know, if you know one bisexual person, you know one bisexual yeah. person. Um, so how, you know, yourself, Jenna, as, as you said, you're, you're bisexual, what that means to you is probably very different than what it means to Brittany. Mm-hmm. Um, I think the only sexuality that you can really say that's what that means is heterosexual and homosexual because it's in the prefix of the word hetero. I want to be with somebody who is of the opposite <laughs> sex. Homo, meaning homogeneous, the same. I want to be with somebody who is of the, uh, the, the same sex. Other than that, I think, you know, bisexual, pansexual, uh, demisexual, all of these things, these, these prefixes mean very different things to the individual who's identifying with that. And, and it goes right back to Brittany being two-spirit. What that means to Brittany is very different than what it would mean to a, another person mm-hmm. from even another cultural, uh, you know, an, another... Um, indigenous community or yeah. even another person from her own community yeah so it's it's all very personal and, and it's it's how you are and who you love and that's ultimately what people need to understand well going off of that actually before we had the recording when we met last week and just had a chat mm-hmm. one thing that stuck with me that sounds like a basic sentiment but it just it rings so true is not comparing yourself to others which is essentially what you said in the situation but i think you can also look at it from those that are being discriminatory or you know those microaggressions that they're not thinking about and then when you call them out on it they're like oh well no i didn't it's maybe because they have a different mindset and they're trying to compare themselves to you and how they were brought up Mm -hmm. compared to another individual is that fair to say yeah i i think you know, it, I, I always tell people, you know, I will answer any and all questions that you have provided you coming at it from a respectful mm-hmm. and, and wanting to, a, a respectful standpoint and wanting to learn. Um, but I always preface it with, but understand, this is just my journey. Experience. This is yeah. my experience. And my answer, it might be completely and totally different than somebody, you know, an, another pansexual man's response. You know, he, he, you know, being pansexual, people think, oh, it's anybody and everybody. I said, well, no, I still have preferences. I still, you know, I, I still have, you know, certain people that I look at and go, yes, you are definitely my type. Mm -hmm. And that's the same in any case, whether you're heterosexual, homosexual, pansexual, it doesn't matter. Um, It comes down to everybody has their aesthetic preferences yeah if you ugly you ugly (laughs) (laughs) yeah exactly but you know um so my being pansexual yes i can be attracted to multiple different gender and sex combinations of gender and sex but i obviously have a preference whereas another pansexual man might have a completely and totally different preference it's just like if you know if you and your brother are both heterosexual and you like them short and blonde haired and feisty and he wants tall dark haired and meek 
well, that's neither of you were wrong. Oh, you're a bad heterosexual. <laughs> it's just meek, just, really? Meek? <laughs> well, no, it's basically nobody likes meek. Nobody likes meek. Ew, brunette. But, I, I, but that's the thing. It's it's not anyone's place to say, well, you're a bad heterosexual man because you have a preference for short blondes over tall brunettes. It's just who you find attractive. Um, so yeah, it's 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 important never to make an assumption based off of something that another person who belongs to that group has told you because mm-hmm. that is their experience. Um, you know, not every trans or queer person has had um, violent ex- experiences and some have and some might have might have not yet and that's a horrible thing to think about that it, you know that could be coming or it might never happen but to assume that every member of the LGBTQ community has had these experiences is also not correct so it's just never assuming that somebody's experience is going to be identical to another person I think the same is to be said for when people ask for what's the indigenous perspective on this I don't I don't know I can't speak for every indigenous person that's ever been alive you mm-hmm. know I can speak from my experience They're like well you have a native studies degree yeah I spent you know a couple years learning this at school but like I still can only speak from my experience as somebody who is reconnecting, as somebody, you know, who grew up in territory that is not my own, that still has to learn, you know, on land that isn't my own, that is somebody who is mixed, right? Like all of these things play into who I am and that is my perspective. So I was listening to Malcolm Gladwell has a podcast out about Will and Grace Mm -hmm. and how um, there's the basically this kind of theory of like when Will and Grace first started, it was like 25% of the people watching were okay with gay marriage. And then by the end of Will and Grace, it was 50%. And it it talks about how we were all kind of forced to watch the same thing because that was the only thing on. On Thursday nights, you watch Friends and then Will and Grace came on right after and everybody was just watching it. And, And it was almost like we were forced to see what other people were doing even though we weren't (laughs) but now it's it's like you only see what you're interested in Mm -hmm. it doesn't force you to look beyond so like you know you when you were on the bus in the 90s you could be sitting next to somebody and after the cheers finale and they watched it too you knew that they watched it everybody was watching the same thing so i'm just curious what you guys have to like have to say about that if 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 you think that because we're only digesting what we are already are what we are interested how much do you think that affects you know i guess the other side or the other people or even using the word other in 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 my opinion i just want to comment on that i think it it gives less of an excuse for people to not do the research Mm -hmm. because i can google what pansexual means in five seconds on my phone and figure it out you know what i mean sorry to interrupt you there jenna it's just that's just my that's just my thought on it but yeah what are, what are your guys' thoughts yeah um it and it's funny that you bring that up trey because you can you can look up anything there's absolutely no excuse for not doing research however such a thing as confirmation bias exists and so if you want to go and find a dozen websites that prove that trans isn't a thing pansexuality is just a a neurochemical imbalance or like you could find probably half a dozen websites that'll prove to you that we're all mentally ill and we're going to hell yeah (laughs) exactly (laughs) however you're right there's there's no reason that anyone should remain deliberately ignorant um in terms of having the ability to really segregate what it is that you're consuming I think that's true to a point because it doesn't matter whether you agree with the LGBTQ community or not. A nerd is a nerd is a nerd. And if you're a Marvel nerd like I am or a Disney geek like I am, um, you know, these studios, well, Disney as a whole, is really doubling down on the fact that, you know, queer people exist and we're not going to shy away from that anymore. 
mm-hmm. and it's one of those things I've actually had somebody go, well, it's just rainbow washing and I don't need it jammed down my throat. And I said, yeah, we didn't need heterosexual superheroes jammed down our throats for the last 70 years, but here we are. You know, I think it's uh, really interesting, uh, especially lately, how, and I do agree with it, that um, there's more of a push to have actual, whether it's people of color or queer people, play characters that are that. Um, And so I was just thinking what it would be like um, if, you know, Will had been played by an actual gay man like Sean. 100%. Sean had been. So that's what I was thinking. Yes. Mm. And that's that's kind of what I'm trying to say is like, I feel like they casted Will to be... To be a macho, almost yes. a macho yes. version to, to of... To help the guys that are being forced to watch this with their wives to be more okay with it. Mm-hmm. Which I obviously did wonders. Like, a lot of people became better and just more willing and accepting after Will and Grace. So maybe, yeah, it did do all the things. But the fact that they had to go through all those hoops during the pilot process and how mm-hmm. they casted him and everything, it just seemed, yeah, it's just crazy. The nineties are a oh, man, the nineties. <laughs> but I think now with TV shows, like for instance, with me, like my wife lo- watches a lot of RuPaul watches, uh, queer eye, like all those shows. So these are shows that admittedly I wouldn't watch on my spare. T- if I was by myself, I wouldn't watch them. Or I wouldn't even try to get into them. But now, like, with her and her, them always being on the TV, I've really, like, man, you should see me when RuPaul's on. Like, I, get, <laughs> I get, like, real. Just not go with those yeah. shoes. <laughs> yeah. I was like, oh, my God, that lip sync battle was awful. Like, I, I could do a way better job than that. But, like, I hear that from a lot of husbands, um, you know, who you know, who are close to me, who would identify as cisgender, straight men, who are like super into these type of shows. And I think, I think that's also making a difference too, right? Where Mm -hmm. it's like when your partner is more open and you're kind of getting into what they're getting into or that kind of thinking, right? For sure. I think ultimately it does, it does speak to the, the influence that experiences have. And so even being in a, a heterosexual relationship and one partner is, uh, very accepting mm-hmm. and and very open and and legitimately doesn't care who you are or, or who who you want to uh, be in a relationship with. That that mentality and the, those values either rub off on their partners mm-hmm. or they deliberately seek partners who share those values. Mm-hmm. Um, and I know that's been the case in my life where. Both both cases have happened where I have deliberately sought partners who are obviously not going to love me in spite of my being queer, but mm-hmm. embrace that aspect and, and truly want to learn more about being allies. But also, I've had a partner where they, they admitted that I, I don't know a lot or I have preconceived notions, but they've remained open to learning. And that is tremendous. And so I think that... Yeah, you know, that just goes to speak to your obvious, you know, you are obviously open and willing to learn. Oh, drag queens are just drag queens and they put on one hell of a show. Mm -hmm. Great. Mm -hmm. And you watch the show with your wife. But yeah, I I think it goes to speak to a lot of, of, you know, how your partner influences you and, and, you know, what your partner saw in you in the first place, especially if one is super open and accepting of the LGBTQ community and the other is maybe not unaccepting but just has never really given it a second thought Mm -hmm. and I think it's conversations too like being safe with one another to have you know certain conversations like for me for instance you know I have transgender friends but I've never you know kind of asked them questions and first I talked because I never got it I never got it I never understood it you know there's so much being said and I, I never understood it. And this came a couple of years ago after a Dave Chappelle docu- um, stand-up special. He's one of my favorite comedians. It came out. Obviously, I'm sure you guys have heard about it. Mm-hmm. Not great things said about the trans community. And so my wife and I just started having conversation because I, I understood that that wasn't right. Um, 
but then I was uncomfortable like asking my transgender friends because I didn't want to offend them. But then after talking with my wife and then having conversations with said friends, I, I think I got more comfortable in, you know, what I know about tra the transgender community. And like you said before, obviously it's just that one person and that one person's experience. But I think it, it you have to have an open mind and you also have to just ask questions and it's okay to not understand. But I don't, I don't think being aggressive about it and making transphobic comments and things like that are also linked or homophobic comments are also, well, they are and they aren't, are linked with, you know, not knowing. Because some people will say um, that their aggression is because they're not knowing or they will say that they, it's not because, does, is that confusing or does that make sense? Like, I get it. I, I think it's kind of like all across the board that way. It, it definitely is the case often where people will use, well, I didn't know any better mm -hmm. as yeah. as an excuse, but then also a justification yeah. uh, and or or a reason to make those jokes you know mm. um, and it's it comes down to like you said a, a willingness to to remain open and learn and it's okay not to understand I also think it's really difficult in both you know bringing back in the indigeneity I think it's really difficult for people to understand something that they've never experienced mm -hmm. so you know you hear it in, in both communities uh people who don't belong to those communities well how long does it take to get over or why do you need another term why do you get a parade and i said well it, it's 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 incredibly difficult to understand we're not trying to elevate ourselves saying oh we queer people are so much better than the than the cisgender straight people but, you know, I actually got, got asked, well, how come there's not a, a straight pride day? I said, every day is straight pride day. <laughs> you don't, you, you, you never get asked about, you know, it, you've never, you, you, you've never had to go and, and fight a rally or like go to a rally or fight a fight to, to marry your partner of the opposite sex. That's just something, that's, that's a right that was given you. Or been asked, are you sure you're straight? Are you sure it's not just a phase? How do you oh, know you're fun. straight? Oh, that's a super <laughs> fun one. How do you know? How, if you've never had sex with a man, how do you know that you're actually bi? Yeah. So if Trey came out as bi, but he's never had sex with, with a male, well, how do you know? And I love looking at people and going, well, how do you know you're straight? You've never had sex with a man. And, 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 and straight men just stare at me. <laughs> and they're like, well, well uh, and I was like, you can't ask a bisexual man, how do you know you're bi if you've never had sex with a man? Yeah. And then not expect the same question thrown back at you there, straight guy. Yeah. And they're just like, well, I, I just know. I said, exactly. exactly. <laughs> well, you know, like I, I, I asked, I've asked my sister, I said, were, were you heterosexual before you had sex? And she just kind of blinked at me. And she said, yeah. I said, and I was pan before I had sex because I had that attraction. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, so it's it's really coming down to, you know, it, it's, it's okay not to understand. It's okay to not know what you don't know, but you have to remain open to I think it's scary things. to ask questions. Yes. I think it can be scary because, like, it's like, how do you even phrase it? Because you don't want to offend anybody. And, and so I do think people kind of get caught in their own head a little bit. I, yeah, definitely. Absolutely. I think people get so worried about offending mm -hmm. other people and, like, putting their foot in their mouth. I and do say, all the time. Yeah, all saying the, time. the wrong the thing. Yeah. But in my experience, like, as a reconnecting person, um, I have never had an experience where another indigenous person has ever rebuffed me, has ever been awful to me about what I don't know. Um, I find that as long as you are coming with an open heart and an open mind and are being honest about your intentions um, and honestly just being like, I don't know. Mm -hmm. Like, I just want to understand. Um, that's gonna be your biggest help. Um, on the 
On the other hand, it's also important to recognize that there are certain aspects that are going to be closed, right? When it comes to like ceremonies or certain knowledge. And within, you know, let's say like the trans community, there's going to be certain parts of it that are not your business, right? Like it is not your business what that person has between their legs, whether they're going to have surgery, whether they're going to be on hormones, unless they offer that to you, right? Mm. And some people don't recognize like because somebody is out as trans, they think that their whole life is open to yeah. be picked apart and to be asked and there is no boundaries. Mm. And it's like, well, like, would you ask like a, a normal, like everyday stranger that you don't know? Like, would you ask anybody else that? I yeah. Think I always equate it, you know, and it's, it's usually either cisgender heterosexual men or or non-heterosexual cisgender women who ask a lot of questions and I always equate it so you know I'm I'm always very open about my my being queer and I always say I have four questions you know respect my right to say that I'm not going to answer that or that I'm not comfortable answering that don't ask it just to be ignorant don't shout it across a crowded room you'd think I wouldn't have to have that rule but here we are <laughs> um and just because you're uncomfortable with my answer doesn't make it any less valid. Yes. Oh. But the number one question I usually get is, a, is you know, a, a one that I, I won't answer. And so I always look at people and I go, okay, Jenna, would it be appropriate for me to ask, did you breastfeed your daughter? <laughs> did, you, did you have a natural birth? Yeah. You know? It's did awkward. It it's so did personal. It, yeah, no, it's so personal. you ask that of a cisgender person of something between their legs or their yeah. breasts or anything so mom to you know, mom we might have that conversation yeah Absolutely. i would be if, a little bit more yeah yeah for if sure the topic was already broached you were talking about you know yeah when mine was younger etc et but we're also of the same community exactly right if i just came up to jenna without knowing her and <laughs> asked her those things yeah that's weird I you should probably so Jenna, phone the police. Did you at that tear? Point. But, but, That's a creepy individual. But, dude. but that is the only way that I can usually get people who are or, to fully you know, understand. Yeah, exactly. So yeah. It is. It is of that level of of of, of intimacy that mm -hmm. you're assuming that some someone who is trans or or gender nonconforming is going to answer these questions to you. Um, and and again, going back to you know certain aspects of. Um, of, of indigeneity and there being certain ceremonies that are closed. Uh, it, it would be the equivalent of me asking any, any, I, I can't even think of a question that would be so personal, to, you know, within a family unit to say, um, you know, who, who's the disciplinarian? Well, some people will be like, oh, that doesn't bother me. I'm Okay, that doesn't bother you, but some couples, some families might be very uncomfortable yeah. at admitting which one. Well, it of just goes with the, the everybody is around. having their own experience. Exactly. Everybody's got their own stuff to deal with. You don't and, want to have to just get so personal with everything. And it, it's, it's very, very difficult to explain it to people who, like I said, have never really had those experiences because... You know, with indigeneity or or being a member of the queer community, you know, I, I you know, uh, if you ask a trans person, well, what, what what was your birth name? Well, first off, they might not really appreciate the term birth name to them. That that's a dead name, and and each individual trans person is probably going to have a different feeling on either one of those those words. And then you know. I, again, you usually get a cisgender woman who goes, well, I'd tell you my maiden name. I said, well, that's not the same thing, is it? Because your maiden name and your married name is a representation, hopefully, if you're still with them, of, of the love and commitment that you made to your partner and the fact that you're a family and you've taken their name. It's a, it's a celebratory thing. Your dead name or your birth name, however you choose to refer to it as, is a representation of somebody who was not you. Mm -hmm. of, of, of that time when people looked at you as, you know, uh, as, as wearing a costume mm -hmm. and not being your authentic self and said, it's not the same thing. You're comparing apples and oranges. Um, yes, they're both fruit. Yes, they're both names, but we're, we're not talking about the same thing here. Yeah. Uh, 
so it's 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 and and I I think it's it's nice that people are willing to try and draw on their own experiences to understand, but that only goes so far. And when you're using it as an excuse to try and get information that you feel entitled to, whether it's about somebody's queer identity or their indigenous identity, that's not okay. So one question you get asked, I'm sure a lot, and I'm, I'm, I'm gonna watch Brittany's expression here is, well, how indigenous are you? Mm. <laughs> and I'm sure we all get, you know, every, every person in this room has probably asked that. And you know, I think people just assume I'm not. <laughs> is what yeah. happens. I, I don't have any. Is but, what, uh. but by asking that, it's it's not the same. People go, well, I I mean, I've got a Scottish last name, and I'm okay telling you I'm 25. percent I said that's that's not the same thing. Though. Yeah, because you're not looking to use it to nullify someone's identity. Exactly. Mm. But also because I think. Oftentimes, people think your indigeneity is simply your race, but it's, it's not. Mm-mm. It's your race. It's your religion. It's your culture. It's your entire identity. So that would be as if you said to you know a fictitious woman named Susie, okay, Susie, you're no longer a cisgender heterosexual woman who is a uh, Protestant who grew up in Scotland. You are now this other thing that we're going to tell you you are. And when you try and say, no, 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 I'm Susie, we're going to go, but how much of a Susie are you? Mm-hmm. It's, it's not just taking away somebody's racial, their, their racial identity or their cultural, it, it is taking away everything. And going into that, it also, you know, especially for Brittany, as she's mentioned, those two are very intertwined, the sexuality and, and her indigeneity. Whereas for a Western you know, white Anglo-Saxon Protestant woman named Susie, those things are just pieces of the pie that make up Susie. So. Um, so this has been a really great conversation, but it, we're kind of hitting that time limit. But we'd like to ask the same question to all of our guests. So I'll ask each of you, what does reconciliation mean to you? Mm. <laughs> We've gotten so many different kinds of answers, so... <laughs> I'm curious. And some people don't like the word reconciliation. Yep. I, yeah, I, I have mixed feelings on, on the word. And, you know, you, we've had those conversations where sometimes it was just, it was the word that they used at the time for the campaign. And now I'm like, mm, the marketing in me goes, oh, that could have been better phrased. However, um, in regards to what we are actually discussing, for me, reconciliation is about holding that space. It's, it's not about what you have to do to make the other person feel better. Sometimes the answer to that question is nothing. Simply hold the space. You don't have to do anything. You don't have to run around trying to do for them. You need to listen and hold that space and if you're going to do anything, let it be something that's done that they have expressed the need for. Um, I, I, I think, you know, when we hear reconciliation, we think about making up. And it goes, oh, please forgive me, I'll do anything. And that's, sometimes you don't have to do anything. You just need to hold space for them to have their feelings and then make an effort to be better going forward and ensure that that doesn't happen again it's not about doing something to make up for it it's holding that space to let the feelings be had and then moving forward and endeavoring not to repeat the issue for me i think that reconciliation has become a bit of a buzzword um Mm -hmm. and in some ways it can cause people to tune out um which is really unfortunate. I can see that. Yeah. yeah. Which is unfortunate because um, I think it can be a really powerful word um, as long as there is action behind it. And I think that it needs to be an action-filled word. I think that it needs to be um, about 
moving forward together. It needs to be about recognizing things that we have been through together um, and honoring that pain because without doing so, you can't move forward in a healthy way. I think that it also means that everybody needs to understand what it means to be an ally um, and how to better behave in ways that are in line with that. So for example, like we talked about today, that means learning your hidden or implicit bias and how that comes out in how you treat people, how you talk to people and in those microaggressions, right? Those things are a great example of how to enact reconciliation in your everyday life. I like that. It's kind of like Christie's reconciliation. Like, yes. That's what she said. And, and I love that. And see, therein lies the don't go out and try and do something until you hear from the people who actually know. Because I, I think oftentimes, like you said, people tune out. It's a buzzword. And they think, oh, okay, I'm going to do something. And usually that doing something requires just paying a check and making people go away because they've tuned out and that's just the cost of doing business now but holding that space and learning what it is that needs to be done first is is important and then moving forward endeavoring not to repeat the issues so Mm -hmm. learning those biases and, and learning how I don't necessarily thinking think it's a do. I think it's a being for me. Hmm. You, you can you can go out and endeavor to be better. Mm. Doing seems like it's very on display as an action. Look, I'm doing uh, this. And I can that's see where, where I, you're where coming. I like don't necessarily the well, I'll, 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 forgive me. I'll do anything. Well, those are just words and those actions without the actual intent behind them of actually endeavoring to be better so as long as it's not performative right exactly yeah i get it so if you're going to do anything endeavor to go out and do better by being more educated and being an ally and that starts with holding space for me hmm. that for, yeah. for me that's where it starts is i think is people like to space. fix things and it's like yes. just fix yourself <laughs> start <laughs> there yeah <laughs> you know work start on with yourself. your issues yeah eh? <laughs> And then reconciliation will come. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. Well, thank you guys so much for having this conversation. I know it's not not only, it's not exactly easy to talk on these subjects. And so thank you very much for, for doing this with us today. And we appreciate it. I think this is one of the most impactful episodes we've had, and it's not even released yet. So thank you guys so much. Just... Just even for me, what I learned and and just hearing you guys speak from your own perspectives and and your identities and how life is for you and your journeys is is wonderful. So thank you guys for coming on. I appreciate it. Thank you so much for having us. I think it's amazing that you guys are providing a platform like this for different voices. Um, And I think you guys are doing amazing work. Thank you. I appreciate that. There were there was some some reticence on my part. I wasn't sure exactly what I was walking into, but you guys just made it such a a safe space. And I think, like Brittany said, you know, you're holding, you're you're, you're providing this platform, and and in your in in that act, you are doing that part in, of reconciliation, and you're holding that space for for important voices. So, yeah, I appreciate it. Yeah. <laughs> Done. Make sure you guys subscribe to Before the Peace using your favorite podcast app or at energeticcity.ca slash podcasts. If you have any guests or program ideas, email us at before the peace at moosefm.ca or before the peace at energeticcity.ca. Also, as I mentioned in the intro, you can reach out to us on Instagram and Twitter. Jenna, what are the usernames again? Because I forgot. At Before the Peace on Instagram and at Before the Peace underscore on Twitter. And that's why I'm going to be sad that she's leaving because she remembers these things. (laughs) Thanks, guys.